Elmer, Vice Chairman Graves, thanks so much for the opportunity to talk to you about this topic. I know congressional staff doesn't get a lot of front page headlines, but uh, to me, it's important to a lot of other people. It's important. And I, I suspect, as you've talked with your members and your staff, that this was going to be an issue that you knew was going to come up um, to for this, the modernization of the committee uh, itself. So, uh, Chairman uh, Kilmer, you, you nailed it in your opening remarks. You nailed the need for congressional staff retention, that, that turnover is a problem, and the, the brain drain that it, that it does to the institution. So uh, it's my role to, to talk today about uh, the data behind the turnover problem, where it is a problem, where it isn't a problem, where it's maybe overstated, um, and then talk about issues for reform. So uh, to reiterate, even though you just nailed this, Chairman, uh, the problem, turnover is high. Uh, in congressional staff, particularly in the first few years and, and, and jobs. Um, that service in Congress is viewed now and explicitly by young folks that I talk to as a resume builder uh, rather than an actual uh, career option. It's seen to get something on your resume for something later, either a private sector job, academia, something for a, a better school application or law school. It's not seen as a career in and of itself, which, which uh, has, its, has its impacts on the institution, as we'll talk about today. And I'm sure you've heard ad nauseum for you, from your personal staffers and other members as well is that it's the low pay and the challenging work environment that, that creates these incentives to turn outside the chamber, to leave, to, to get your years of service in and then go cash in somewhere else. Uh, I always make the bad joke that you can't pay people too little and give them a bad work environment at the same time, that you have to choose one or the other. Congress has decided to do both. And I think we can, we have the opportunity now with this committee and, and, and the momentum we have now to, to actually change that for the better. And then I will just point out that the, the member level frustrations that you all feel, um, especially in your first few years of service in, in Congress, uh, are true for your staff. Maybe not to the same degree that you all have, um, but they're absolutely true in a day to day that the expectations that you had when you come to Congress um, often don't match the reality of the day to day. And that has a grinding effect on, on what it means to serve in Congress and why you might look to turn outside the chamber for work. So things like polarization, the, the lack of communication between the two parties, the limit of impact on the policy process, right? These kids come here to do the exact right thing. They have the motivation, the, the public service bent that we want our service members to have. Uh, but then that erodes very quickly once you get into the, the, the true nitty gritty of the congressional environment. And then you add in a tough work-life balance and low pay. Uh, it's understandable why, why a lot of staffers leave early to go find work somewhere else. So just to give some numbers behind the problem, you've probably heard from a couple different folks that uh, there's not one position in Congress in which the median tenure is longer than three years, including chief of staff. And, and that's true. Um, you see here, there's a lot going on in this chart, but uh, the yellow bar will tell you how much, what percentage of staff within that current position are planning to leave in, in the next year. So that turnover is going to increase in the next year. You see at the entry level positions, the staff assistants and legislative correspondents, over 50% of those folks are planning to leave in the next year. Again, creating that turnover at the, the entry level positions. But even if I can draw your attention up to the chief of staff position, uh, only 25% of the chamber's chief of staffs have been in that job for five years, which may sound like a lot in an in a uncertain congressional environment, but that job is incredibly hard. It's incredibly hard to earn that expertise and to know the ways of the hill. These people stuck around to do that, uh, um, to gain that expertise, and they're, and they're good at it. And, but even 25% of them, are, or almost 75% of them, are planned to leave in the next few years, again, contributing uh, to that turnover problem we know is there. But what this indicator doesn't tell us and doesn't factor in is the motivations behind uh, why people leave. Some turnover is good and you want, especially entry level people to, to look elsewhere for employment if it means a promotion. And Congress doesn't, doesn't often have those, those certain career paths. So staffers look outside the chamber to give uh, some certainty to their position. So it is my recommendation, recommendation to always look for policies that, that decrease that uncertainty of what their career will look like in one, three, five years from now, which Congress uh, by virtue of it being in the political cycle, can't always do. And then one other thing, a caveat that I'll mention on this chart is that uh, though no, no position has over three years of median tenure, what this doesn't factor in is, is previous jobs and adding that tenure on. So if you have a chief of staff with a tenure of five years, it's likely that that wasn't his or her first job. So this chart doesn't add in those previous years of service, which would skew these, uh, this, these tenures a little bit down, 
But as I've played with this data for far too long, for far too many hours, it's not much that it skews it down, but I just wanted to point that out in the interest of disclosure. Mm -hmm. So another thing that we should look at is, and what I've spent a lot of time on is to look at, at turnover rates over time, to see if this is a, a common problem uh, in the modern environment, or if this was true uh, for the last decade or so. And I can tell you that it is true. It's in a remarkably stable uh, attribute of Congress by party over time. So again, a lot going on here, but at the bottom of the chart, you'll see turnover ratios. So think of that as percent of staff turning over every year. And you'll see that it's remarkably consistent between Democrats and Republicans at about 19, 20% per year uh, leaving their office, which means each and every Congress, about 40% of staff are expected to turn over. So just think about how that impacts the congressional environment, impacts your ability to pass things like budgets and NDAAs, where it's incredibly specific work when you're having to retrain 40% of your staff, not only retrain, but go find them and then get them up to speed on what it means to be a congressional staffer. So again, this doesn't talk about the motivations of people that are turning over, but it, it does show that this is not a new phenomenon. It's not a, a polarized phenomenon. This is a congressional phenomenon that, that hopefully we can start to take bites out of. And then finally, you've, you've likely, your first question is, okay, why do we have such high turnover? And you've been told probably ad nauseum, not by me only, but by a lot of people, maybe including your staff, that it's, it's low pay, that you can't give us a tough work environment um, when you can't pay us to, to, to well enough to, to take that, that the brunt of that bad work environment, that you look outside for someone else to pay you, because the reality is that there's a private sector here, a whole economy built on influencing Congress. So it is once you get to Congress that you, you develop the networks, the relationships, the know-how, the expertise that becomes even more valuable um, outside of Congress to then impact Congress, or you just leave Congress altogether. So there's a, there's a lot of phenomenons and, and uh, dynamics playing on at the same time. So just think about you're in the lives of a staffer. You come here, you're able to take the, the financial brunt uh, to come here to bunk up in a very expensive city, um, to bunk up with several people to pay your low, your bills with a low congressional salary because you're you're betting on yourself that that, that that tenure in Congress will provide you a better opportunity elsewhere. And then as you transition in your life, these are young 22, 25 year olds just out of college, but then people start to want to get married, to start to have families, to, to start to want to have a, a house and a mortgage. And the congressional environment, for all intents and purposes, can't pay you to do that in Washington, D.C. So right when you get good at the job, right when you get that experience where you're starting to impact things, that's when you get more valuable outside the chamber. And that's why we see these opportunity costs. Uh, look at the Congressional Council, Council Office. Congress pays them about a median of $60,000 outside the chamber within Washington, D.C. for similar experience, you're getting about $170,000. That's a too big a bite for a lot of people to, to take and to leave um, and to, to, to force year after year, especially as they're trying to transition at the next part of their lives, pay off their student debt, which is becoming an increasing problem with young staffers coming to the Hill. It, it just gets too big of a gap to take year after year. So people logically look outside the chamber to pay them. Um, there's a lot of reforms that we can do, some bigger than others, and I'm excited to talk about these things. I just wanted to give you the, the quantitative backing to these problems that we can kind of give specifics of why people leave at certain points of their lives. Um, I'm going to kick it over to Dr. Pearson, who's going to talk about the reforms of our APSA subcommittee. And then I have some other uh, small to big reforms that I'm excited to talk about, but I think we can get to those during Q&A. So thank you for the opportunity, and, and I'll pass it over to Dr. Dr. Pearson. You're now recognized for five minutes. Great. Thank you, Chairman Kilmer and Vice Chairman Graves and distinguished members of the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, as Chairman Kilmer said, I am an Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Minnesota, and I chaired the Subcommittee on Staff Diversity and Retention that constituted a part of the APSA Task Force on Congressional Reform. And I should note here, the political scientists actually don't get together very often to form task forces. It was the problems with Congress that really motivated this task force to exist. I also want to note that uh, Jake Olson is one of my distinguished students from my congressional politics class. I think he took congressional politics the very first time I taught it as an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. This, the APSA subcommittee members included seven political science PhDs who also brought professional experiences working on Capitol Hill and in congressional district offices, 
working in human resources and management, and working with organizations promoting diversity. I graduated from college and came to Capitol Hill in 1993 with a stack of resumes and an internship. After I don't know how many informational interviews, I found a job and I worked on Capitol Hill for five years for both a Democrat and a Republican. And in the process, I experienced two distinct office cultures. I left the Hill in 1998 to get my PhD, but I continue to study and closely follow Congress. And Congress faces a critical challenge in retaining and diversifying its staff. I don't need to tell you how important congressional staff are to every aspect of your role. And efforts to improve congressional capacity and hopefully in turn also reduce partisan polarization ultimately depend on the quality and expertise of staff. We respect that every member's office has some degree of autonomy. Nonetheless, by modernizing its human resources operations and improving staff compensation and professional development programming, Congress can reestablish itself as a desired place of employment where talented professionals build long-term careers. Moreover, many of the reforms that we propose would actually save members in their offices time and hopefully money because they streamline many human resources functions. So I wanna briefly lay out our five recommendations and I can elaborate during Q&A. The first recommendation is to improve the collection and dissemination of data on the compensation and demographic breakdown of congressional staff. Dr. Burgett presented some great data, but our subcommittee realized that in order to fully understand the current problems and to track progress in staff retention and diversity over time, Congress needs better information about staffing practices. We recommend that Congress require systematic information collection, building on existing hiring practices using the payroll authorization form to also gather basic demographic questions about race, ethnicity, and gender following EEOC mandates, as well as questions about education and experience. This information should be submitted to the Chief Administrative Officer of the House, and it should be made publicly available in a machine-readable format on the CAO's website. Further, we recommend that the CAO produce and submit to Congress an annual report that documents staff salaries and benefits broken down by race, gender, and position of both DC and district office and committee staff in the House. Our second recommendation relates to increasing workplace diversity. Cultivating a workforce that reflects the diversity of the nation along multiple dimensions, including race, gender, ethnicity, region, and economic background is fundamental to achieving representation of constituent views. Further, more diverse workplaces reflect better reflect the needs of a heterogeneous society and achieve better outcomes. In 2019, the House established the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. We recommend that Congress strengthen and expand its role and place it, very importantly, outside of party leadership offices and within the House Chief Administrative Office. It must be a nonpartisan and permanent office insulated from politics and inconsistent budget appropriations. Achieving a more diverse workplace must start with recruitment and also expand the candidate pool to provide offices with a path excuse me, to recruiting a highly qualified and more broadly representative workforce. So we have a series of recommendations about the office maintaining a public website with information about diversity plans, evaluations of diversity efforts, and efforts to publish, publicize both internship and fellowship programs and also jobs. Um, and I can talk more about those uh, recommendations in Q&A. We also want, uh, to enhance increased access to congressional employment opportunities by modernizing job listings and resume banks. And then we also recommend that the House Placement Service maintain a searchable resume database with information on job seekers. This database would be open to all interested job candidates and would provide self-reported voluntary information regarding many demographic uh, characteristics and would be accessible to congressional staff with hiring responsibilities and to the Office of Diversity, Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, we also recommend that the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, in, in coordination with the House uh, Placement Service, hold information sessions about employment opportunities, um, both in person and online. Our third recommendation has already been touched on uh, in depth by Dr. Burgett, but it is perhaps the most critical, and it's staff retention through better compensation. We all know that the top reason given by congressional staff is low pay. So to combat the revolving door and to increase retention, we strongly recommend that Congress increase congressional staff salaries coupled with an increase in the MRA. 
Relatedly, each congressional office is markedly different in the types and amounts of non-salary benefits they offer to staff. Some offices offer student loan repayment assistance, some offer regular sick leave, some don't. These office by office differences result in inconsistent compensation combinations that leave staff unaware and uncertain about their non-salary compensation packages. So we, recommending, we recommend standardizing benefits across congressional offices to allow staff to better understand and anticipate their compensation. Our fourth recommendation relates to advancement in professional training. A highly trained staff benefits the institution and also increases the satisfaction and retention of individual staffers. So we have two recommendations, one regarding individuals' uh, job responsibilities. Um, so the first would be mean at least two sessions of in-person CRS legislative training and online training in constituent service with different modules for DC and district offices. The second would relate to a robust professional development program uh, so that highly trained sa staff members will become more satisfied with their jobs. Uh, this ongoing professional development program would include regular life on the hill events and offer a mix of speaker and training sessions where panelists would discuss hill specific advancement and networking events. It would also be important to cooperate and coordinate with other groups that are already involved in such programming. And finally, our fifth recommendation relates to staff management and workplace climate. Office management, management and office culture vary considerably between individual offices. In some offices, poor performance in these areas come at a significant cost to members in the institution. It's rarely intentional. Many staff in supervisory roles have not had sufficient experience or training to effectively manage and motivate staff, and many staff are not even aware of their rights as employees. So we propose that Congress institute two new types of mandatory training, including in-person human resources uh, sessions for staff located in D.C., and online training for district staff to ensure that they know their rights, benefits, and responsibilities, and in-person management training for staff in supervisory roles, including chiefs of staff and district directors. The topics in both trainings should include sexual harassment and discrimination prevention, promoting diversity and inclusion, employee rights and benefits, and ethics rules. Trainings for chiefs of staff and district directors should also include uh, management training on such issues as navigating the congressional and district work schedule, conduct conducting effective annual reviews, dealing with performance issues, cultural competency, and motivating staff. We also recommend that orientations for newly elected members focus on these issues as well. In summary, the job of a congressional staffer has long featured long hours and relatively low pay. Yet maintaining Congress's policymaking capacity and co-equal role depends on attracting and retaining individuals with professional expertise and a long-term commitment to their jobs. In providing greater protections and a clearer career pathway for staff, we also need to balance concern with member independence and autonomy, but in doing so, Congress can enhance its ability to perform its lawmaking and oversight functions. Thank you. Thank you both uh, for your testimony. We're going to move on to questions and um, uh, uh, we will um, uh, go uh, first me and then uh, Vice Chair Graves, and then we'll go in order of uh, seniority um, switching off Democrat to Republican. So let me just start with a question to both of you. You know, understanding that raising sal salaries would likely do the most to increase staff retention on the Hill. What, in your view, are sort of the second and third most important steps that we could take to convince talented staff to stick around? It seems like it's always going to be hard for Congress to compete with private sector salaries, so no matter how much we pay. So what, what can Congress offer that might tip the scales, uh, you know, in favor in, of working in this environment? Right. It's the right question. I wish there was a, a better answer than just increasing MRA, but I will say that the, the lack of certainty is a, is a big deal. Um, to not know job security, I don't think that you'll ever you'll ever fix that problem, given that we have elections. But there are things that you can do to provide certainty in what the next year or the next uh, two years looks like. So things like uh, tenure bonuses to guarantee after X years of service, you get this. So staffer knows that in, if I stick around for one more year, then I get X number of dollars guaranteed to me. The standardization of benefits across offices I can't tell you the number of times that I've heard anecdotally from people that they go in search of offices with certain benefits that are valuable to them. So not 
not making them the exact same because I respect the the member to member autonomy that you all have. And I think that's important, but providing minimums of those things so that you know that once you go to a new office, you won't get less than um, somewhere else uh, at the bottom of the floor. So just guaranteeing those minimums, uh, the tenure bonuses, and then just the, the work life balance. If there's a, a silver lining to maybe this pandemic, it's that you recognize that there's some of some of the roles that, that you have, some of the duties that they have can be done from from home, from online, so that you reach that when people, when staffers reach that critical juncture between uh, moving to the next phase of their lives with families and, and, and mortgages, um, that they, they're they able to minimize the, the the sacrifices they're making. And if it's not pay, then it's certainty of, of childcare benefits and subsidies, uh, work from home balance, things like that, um, that aren't necessarily reflect, reflected in the salaries, but send a big message when you give it to them um, and, and increase that certainty office to office. I want to echo everything that Dr. Burgett said. I completely agree. And then also just emphasize uh, one of the subcommittee recommendations, which is for uh, professional training, both training that will uh, enhance staffers' ability to do their current job, but also provide them with a path, a career path to stay on the Hill. Um, because there's such high turnover, I think oftentimes in congressional offices, individual staff don't get the training that they need. And it's really no one's fault. Offices are high pace, people are busy, but really requiring individual staff members to do that congressional research service training, um, which will probably require you know, bolstering that training and increasing its availability, would send a strong message. I think I've heard of instances where uh, some staffers who are even interested in doing the CRS training are discouraged from their offices from doing so because it would be seen as taking time away from the critical office function. So ensuring training for the jobs that they are doing, but then also having those uh, opportunities to build their professional networks and learn about other careers on the Hill. Thanks. Um... I also am curious, any out of the box ideas that you can suggest? You know, we know that decent salaries and benefits matter a lot, but are, are there some innovative approaches we might take to recruit staff who might not otherwise consider a career on the Hill? So, for example, a few weeks ago, we heard from some tech experts who suggested broadening internship and fellowship pools to include people who have backgrounds in the digital or tech and science spaces or looking for vet veterans who have training in tech or policy issues. I, I'm just curious if you have anything that, um, you know, beyond what you've already shared that we ought to be thinking about. In terms of what we envision the uh, Office of Diversity doing, it would be to really increase efforts at minority serving institutions, um, universities in the area such as Howard, but then also do a nation nationwide recruitment of uh, a diverse pool of interns um, from different geographic, economic backgrounds. Um, we also talked a lot about the importance of reaching out to veterans who would be excellent um, staffers on Capitol Hill. And so really just thinking much more broadly about the pool of interns that both the House as an institution reaches out to, but also individual member offices within their districts. There are, there are two that, that come to mind right away. One is a, a standardization of loan forgiveness, student loan forgiveness. So mirroring a lot of districts in the country where after X number of years of service, your loan is subsidized or even repaid by the government because of that service. Uh, again, it increases the certainty that you, you get a staffer that knows I have a, a number of years to serve before that benefit kicks in. They're, the motivation to stick around is much higher. And then another one that is becoming increasingly clear given the environment of Washington, D.C., the, the culture, the drinks, networking environment, is the House and, and Senate providing mental health counseling. It's, a, it's not a huge cost uh, to, the, to the Congress to provide it an in-house mental health counseling availability to staffers. This is a high pressure, high anxiety environment where everyone's pretending to know more than they do. Uh, getting through their day-to-days is very hard, especially if they're working phones or dealing with constituent requests. Um, my wife is a therapist. Her, She has a practice in Washington, DC. Almost all of her clients are staffers. And it's the, the common thread between each of her clients is it's a, it's a high network culture where uh, addiction becomes an issue because every night is a happy hour and you, you're trying to plan your next job now. So it's a small cost for a huge benefit. It, and it sends a right signal for the United States Congress to recognize the need for mental health counseling and to be a leader in providing that for its public servants. Thank you both. Uh, next up, Vice Chair Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I hope I hope um, my reception is a little better this time. 
So I, I was really thinking through this, and it's fascinating, um, quite frankly. Um, when, when I think about the 19% that was stated earlier, and I think about the election cycles, and I think about the number of retirements that occur, and, and, I, and I sense that must contribute to some, some uh, staff moving on to other, other places, and some of it's just political. A Republican gets replaced by a Democrat in an office, and that most likely does clear out uh, some staff just for a changeover. So I, I imagine that's compensated for in the statistics. But then, and, and Casey, I'm glad you mentioned that it's it's really hard to compensate for how, when a person moves from one position to the next to the next. Because um, I know in our office, it's, it's something we advocate for. I want to see those who work for me and work with me, part of my team, advance whether that's in our office or if it's in the administration or if it's in a committee or another office, because I think it's important to have upward mobility for everybody. So maybe one day there's a way to sort of calculate all that because we have two members of this committee who are great examples of that succession and success, uh, Mr. Davidson and Mr. Woodall, who, who made it all the way up to uh, to just shy of senator. And and who knows, maybe they'll, they'll get there some someday. But can you share with us maybe what it, what do you expect we might uh, see the changes to, to your analysis as it relates to this work from of your recommendations uh, that um, uh, uh, maybe provide for some more flexibility or the ability to work in a, in a out of a uh, I guess a community that has a lower cost of living that more aligns with the pay and such. Have you had any chance to think through that yet? Um, just anecdotally, and I will say that if you're asking these questions, um, then it's a good sign that you already think about the health and well-being of your staff. So I will just reiterate that every office is it's the Wild West. You, you cross office doors. The environment is absolutely different. So the commitment that you have to your staff is is perfect and commendable and it reflects in your numbers. But that's not true across the board. There's not a similar commitment there. Um, but from the work from home argument, it, it's it's a huge one, especially as as staff transition to starting to have young kids. I have a three year old and one year old, and I I don't know how I would be able to work uh, on Capitol Hill, which which is not good because I want to. <laughs> um, but uh, the work from home is going to be really hard to legislate, and it's going to be a, a member level commitment um, to 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 offer that to your job. And I can just tell you just from experience that not members share that commitment. They want people in their in their office, and they equate that to hard work, and they they don't um, trust uh, that that the work is being done if they're not in the office. So, out, absent of, of writing a really very hard bill to write to legislate at, that in, it's more of a member level commitment that that reflects the the, the values of the member themselves. Just to add. Uh, thank you. This is a great question. And I think it would really also help with some of the gender diversity problems that we see as well. We see, you know, many young women come to Capitol Hill. Uh, in some positions, there are many more women than men. But then when you look at that chief of staff, legislative director level, the number of women really fall off. And even if, you know, they get on the waiting list and get into Capitol Hill child care centers, you know, they still got to pick the kids up by a certain time and there are still votes happening late into the night. And so I think more ability for staff members um, you know at every level to work from home would be helpful rather than leaving it to individual members i had one boss that made 90 percent of the staff stay till midnight if the house were voting and one boss that made everyone go home so it really it really varies by member office well thank you both uh, your recommendations and work is is um, really been helpful to us as a committee and uh and mr chairman i imagine as we uh, given the circumstances certainly we're unfortunate but now we've been able to maybe see a new way to provide um, to our own workforces uh, some options and some flexibility that might better match with some of the restrictions and limitations we have uh, within our MRAs and otherwise. But thank you both and uh, I yield back. I, sorry to cut in, I will say that Chairman, Vice Chairman Graves, that this is the most diverse house in the US history and it's the most diverse uh, population of staffers in house's history either. And those things, it's not a coincidence. Uh, the staffing uh, decisions made by members often near the demographics of members as we've seen an increase of, of women rep representatives uh, we see an increase of women staffers all the way up to higher level positions so it's often a mirroring of the values and even the demographics of those that are elected and we're, we're trending good it's just slow thanks very much uh next up uh uh representative scanlon
Sorry, just trying to get myself online here. <laughs> Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I've been really interested in, in this idea because I used to work on this um, in my former life at a law firm um, and the issues of retention and re recruitment and training and, and how do we move in that direction. Um, but it seems like one of the big issues we have to confront in Congress is um, how do we pay for this um, and the, the problem with increasing the MRA. Um, do you have any suggestions on how we can um, work on the staff compensation issue um, and get workarounds or buy-in um, if it means spending more money on Congress, God forbid. Um, and Danny, I guess Dr. both of you, yeah. If you did. Thank you, and and that's a great question. I mean, we're quite cognizant of the politics that surround this. Um, I think there's sort of two answers. One would be looking for savings in other areas of congressional reform, whether it's streamlining or technological changes to make things more efficient. But I think the biggest and most important thing is bipartisan agreement that this is important and that the Congress is committed to this. Not so that people can hire another press sec secretary, that's not what this money is being used for. It's so that members can pay expert staff who have policy expertise, who can do constituent outreach so that government is more transparent um, along with better data collection so that people get more value from the people's house through better staff. And so I, I'm very cognizant of the politics surrounding that. Um, and I would hope that members of both parties would come together and sort of recognize that um, then at a bipartisan basis, this is worth defending um, with the rationale that it will better serve the American people. Absolutely. I completely echo all of those things and to get very specific in what that money is going to be used for. So there's evidence that when you get an increase in MRA, you use it for communication staff and you use it for district staff. Um, you can itemize exactly what increases would be for, whether it's increasing committee staff or if you think about oversight, um, uh, certain investigative lawyers or certain backgrounds that this mm -hmm. money can only be used for these purposes. And then to get at least speak to the political argument that I'm sympathetic towards um, you can institute this in X number of years. We, we recommend this, this increase in funds to be carried out in two Congresses from now that you remove it or at least distance yourself from the, the election dynamics. We don't know who's going to be in majority in four years, but we do know on a bipartisan basis that this is needed. And so to, to get away from the, the threat of a campaign ad of spending more on you now, um, this is four, six years from now to be instituted because it is a problem. Um, one of the other things we've been looking at a lot is, you know, kind of standardizing, as we've said, some of the central um, services, HR resources, best practices, um, that kind of thing. Can you just talk a little bit about the, the kinds of things you might see being put into a centralized HR department? Um, maybe start with Casey and then go to Catherine. Sure, it's it's again setting minimums of uh, sick days across offices or paternity leave or maternity leave or that there's a certain percentage of student loan repayment across office. It's, 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 it's minimizing the office by office differences that, that really get people to buy into new, to your individual office and then don't seek out other offices that are providing the benefits at higher rates than the one you currently serve in. So standardizing those um, and then standardizing the, the, the trainings across offices. So it's not, you're not subject to your members a valuing of that training or your LDs valuing of that training to not give you the time off to go do those. And then we can be really good about, uh, as this environment has taught us now, about putting these things online for staffers to, to access at any given time. So CRS, I used to work there and we were very standardized of when this training is going to be once a month, 2 p.m. in this room. And that's not how Congress works. You don't know what's going to happen <laughs> two hours from now, let alone one month from now. So putting these things online, use the technology that we have, especially with young staffers coming online. This is how they got through college, too. So it's going to be a very familiar environment. Um, to, to just place that in a centralized office, then you're not subject to each individual members valuing those at the same degree. Catherine, anything? 
Thanks. I would just echo everything that uh, Dr. Burgett said uh, w with also the addition of it would also save offices time to do similar training for new interns. Um, I think both in person have an but also have an online module. Often interns aren't trained very well. Again, it's not for any you know sort of malicious reason. It's because offices are busy and there's a constant churn of interns. But having intern training that's uniform, I think, would be very helpful as well. Oh, that's a great idea as we try to onboard interns virtually. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good idea. Um, also, I mean, another area I was interested in is recruitment and diversifying our recruitment strategies. And it feels like that's an area where um, an HR department is going to be more helpful, having a more centralized point of access um, and to d really develop those connections because it does seem to um, come down to who's the right person at particular institutions, not just sending something out to every college in the country because it ends up in the virtual waste bin most of the time. Any thoughts or suggestions in that realm? Yeah, offering the, the resume bank where you are able to input very specific uh, skills and talents and histories so that the, that the person in charge of hiring in your office can can better itemize for the specific uh, position. Um, so I'm thinking like a, a bachelor's degree in political science, but has worked X number of years, like you're able to fill instead of being forced to see the resume in front of your face, you're able to tailor your hiring based on what you what you see. And so you're able to quantify metrics that, that speak to that. And then I will say that this is uh, becoming a, another hobby horse of mine, but more purposeful hiring for the actual positions. So when you see a resume, a Harvard uh, political science, everyone coming to Congress has a poli sci bent, right? But not all of what they do has a poli sci specific thing. So think of constituent service. That is a very different job than in LA, even though you're probably hiring the same types of people. So thinking about it more purposefully of people with a social work background, the ones that they're dealing with constituent service calls, they're not calling to congratulate you on doing your job most times. They either want something, they're there to complain. And that's a hard day, day after day, which can contributes to the turnover of those entry level positions. So thinking about the skills that you can actually respond to those to empathize to hear better, which is better both for the person calling in, it's better for the day to day of the staffer. And it's definitely better for you all as members, because those guys are representing you on the phone. So the specific skills and talent should better mirror the actual job that they're doing on a day to day basis, which takes a lot of uh, upfront work and time, but it definitely pays off. Mm -hmm. And also, hopefully, over time, uh, with a nonpartisan, institutionalized House Office of Diversity, the how that office could play a role as well, both in terms of outreach, but then also helping any individual member offices who are struggling to diversify their office find candidates who are appropriate to their office, appropriate to their constituency, but also help in, in attaining more diversity. Okay, and and the last thought, um, Dr. Burgett, it's just your earlier statement and what you just said just brought to mind the idea of the fact that our folks who do answer the phones really take a lot, especially yeah. in first a polarized political environment and then a very fraught economic, public health, um, civic unrest. Um, so these folks really are getting hit a lot. I know um, in the public interest legal world, there's a lot of training around secondary trauma and how to promote self-care, I think providing support in in that arena might be helpful as well because I know there have been times when the staff is I walk back to the office after being out all day you know on the floor in hearings or something and people just look shell-shocked <laughs> yes. so um, some kind of resources in that direction seem like a really appropriate thing to do absolutely thank you I yield back great uh, next up is Mr. Woodall and then uh, it looks like Mr. Cleaver after that. Hey, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I, I want to thank uh, uh, our two witnesses for, for being here. I'll get right into it. Uh, I think we can solve whatever problem we put our minds to. I'm just not sure that we're all putting our minds to the same problem. Uh, Dr. Burgett, I looked at that chart you put up about uh, pay in the private sector versus Capitol Hill. Uh, it was almost the same for staff assistant positions, zero salary incentive for staff assistants to leave Capitol Hill for the private sector. And yet when we looked at your turnover chart, that was the position that had the single highest level of turnover. Um, I've got a staff assistant who's leaving me at the end of the month. He's going to go on to Harvard Law School in the fall. 
Uh, I've got a half a dozen uh, law school review uh, editors uh, that worked at my front desk. I don't need to retain those people. They had somewhere else they wanted to go. I don't need to pay those people more. Uh, they uh, thought they got a great bargain uh, in the in the work they gave and the salary they got. Uh, that's not necessarily true uh, with caseworkers. It's not necessarily true uh, with councils and LDs. Um, when we're talking about staff retention, uh, can we really talk about it in a in a singular uh, way, or do we have to talk about it uh, position by position? And as a as a secondary thought for your uh, response, are we talking about it for a member or talking about it for the institution? Uh, you both advocated for standardizing benefits. Well, I'm a great boss. Tom Graves is a great boss. Derek Kilmer is a great boss. So we keep people a whole lot longer than other folks. I'm not in-house leadership. I can't offer what Kevin McCarthy or Nancy Pelosi can offer uh, in a leadership challenge, but I can offer a better benefit package and a better place to work. So as we try to create retention, um, do you consider uh, folks leaving me every six months to go work for Nancy Pelosi a successful retention program because they stayed in the House, or do I need to focus on member uh, retention uh, so that we can build uh, that expertise? Uh, and uh, Dr. Pearson, if I can uh, start with you since I referenced uh, Dr. Burgett's uh, charts and finish up with him. Great, thank you so much. And those are those are terrific points, and I think, Part of your observation really underscores our need for better data. And that's why the APSA subcommittee report started out with the recommendation to create, uh, to collect more and better data and make it publicly available. Because Dr. Bergat has the best data out there of any political scientist studying Congress. But yet, because of limits of the data, we don't actually know where all these staff assistants go. Um, we, and so, by collecting better data and having an exit survey, we could better address some of these questions. Because absolutely, we want staffers to be promoted into more senior positions in the same office and bring that expertise with them, um, or maybe another congressional office. I mean, that's a good thing. But when people leave the Hill for the private sector or to go lobby because they're dissatisfied with their pay or working conditions, that's a real loss for Congress. And so I think one of the things that this committee can do is really make the push to better co to collect more data and then have the chief administrative officer report on that data to Congress every year so that we would be better able to answer the precise questions about movement within each level, whether it's off the Hill or to another office. And then we would also have metrics for gauging success for any reforms that this committee passes. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of your question about is it member level or institutional level, I think the answer is it's both. Um, we want the institution of Congress to succeed. We want it to represent constituents across America. And then of course, individual members have their own incentives to succeed. But the members who don't manage their staff well, who don't give their staff the same level of benefits that you do, I don't think they're malintentioned. That's why we're recommending more training for managers so that people know what's out there. You know, some chiefs of staff come to the Hill with uh, a position with a lot of experience and others come from members campaigns and don't know how to manage a staff or provide the, the motivation um, and, and proper direction that people need. There was a lot there, uh, Representative, and and you're right that we can't treat all staff as a singular resource. We can't get, as Dr. Pearson was talking about, we can't get at the motivations for reasoning, uh, for leaving the Hill. When you were speaking about your staff assistants, uh, two thoughts came to mind. One is that there's an issue of self-selection here. It's people that come to Congress. That means that they they made a choice at some point, and often they had the the resources to come there to know that they're spending a short amount of time because they're in. Uh, in it for the resume build, there's a the, there's a common line of jumping from uh, uh, entry level staff assistant to to law school. They know that they ultimately want to get to law school. They know that they need a differentiator on their law school application, and the U.S. Congress has provided that for them. So it's a self selection effect where the people with the resources to go to law school in the first place are using Congress. They have the resources to go to Congress for a short amount of time, not for a career, but for their own institutional uh, or or betterment. Um, which which speaks to the point that 
we, we treat staff as a singular resource, but they have motivations in and of themselves, right? They want better jobs. They, they have their own motivations and to talk about them, to paint with the, the broad brush of all of them, or this is a problem for all of them is not true. Um, but we do need to look at this ab in abstractions and, and over time problem and, and the, the institutional resource that they are. There is no school for this. There is political science degrees, but I got a doctorate in, in uh, Congress and I never saw a piece of legislation in any class that I ever took. There is a difference between knowing Congress and serving Congress. And to, to reward that as an institutional resource by paying them to stick around is better for the institution because it's a $4 trillion budget. They deal with derivatives and farm subsidies on the same day. It's impossible to do this in any way except for on the ground. So you want them to stick around because that's where you learn on the job because there's no one else to do it. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I, I will uh, uh, yield back. We've got a chance for a second round. I'd be happy to uh, to do it, but we've talked a lot about standardizing uh, benefits. Uh, it would be interesting to to hear from our experts uh, sometime about non-standard benefits. Uh, Harvard Law School is going to offer a different scholarship package to that first-generation uh, American, uh, to that African-American valedictorian uh, from South Georgia. Uh, you 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 pick the pick the category. Folks don't get diversity just by intentionality; they also get it by a differentiation. Of a, of a support package. Uh, I don't need to pay that self-selector that Casey just mentioned uh, more money to get to Capitol Hill. I might need to pay somebody who's trying to support uh, their husband and their, uh, and their child uh, more money to get them to Capitol Hill. And, and we do seem to talk more about standardization uh, than differentiation. And again, that goes back to my original point. Whatever problem we try to solve, I'm certain we can successfully do it. I'm just not sure that, that uh, every solution is uh, is uh, is going to to solve the the, the core problems that we're we're working on. I very much appreciate the two of you being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Thank you. Uh, next up, Mr. Cleaver. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, let me apologize for getting on late. We had some technical problems uh, on this end, uh, but I'll I'll pass um, because I'm just getting in on on the conversation. I'd, I'd rather uh, yield to someone who's been there for for uh, the whole meeting. Okay, next up, uh, Ms. Brooks. Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks to um, our experts for being here and for advising us. It's really, it's fun listening to you because you both are studying what we live each and every day, and it'd be kind of fun to uh, come back and take your class and maybe have some debates and discussions. Um, and actually, that's kind of what I want to talk about. Maybe I will audit your class, Dr. Brigitte. I'm retiring from Congress. and um, But I, I want to talk a little bit, what we really haven't talked about is that every year, members retire from Congress or then they, they members get defeated in November. Um, in the case of retirements, um, often those retirement announcements they happen at you know random times but uh mostly for our party structure we're encouraged to announce earlier rather than later in a term um for the sake of uh candidates back home but it also can be uh, a tremendous um diff a very difficult time for staff um and like right now during the pandemic and luckily I haven't lost any staff, but I, I, uh, during this pandemic, our staff are incredibly busy. They are slammed with constituent work. And, um, the, and yet right now, and I said during this, our strategic planning session, my goal was to help find each and every one of them who wanted to stay involved in uh, working either in the district or on Capitol Hill. I wanted to really work to help them find another job. Uh, so, in, in, so I'm concerned about losing incredible amount of expertise of our staff. Do you have any ideas of how we, at the same time, not lose staff, but yet help them find their job? It's a great question, and I commend you for thinking about this because I promise you not every member does, especially when it comes at the hands of defeat. They have other issues on their mind. Staff often come right. way too late in this process. So I commend you on doing that. Um, what I will say is that there is a transition period of the new new office member coming in to, to replace you um, that doesn't isn't taken advantage of very well. 
um, you are able to provide, just like with an administration change at the presidential level, you are able to provide uh, 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 resources, expertise, even literal staff members to say, this is how I ran my office. These are the roles that they played. They are available to you um, to actually help you get to the, to the ground running on day one rather than them staffing up once they get here. So I say take advantage of that at, um, that transition times once you know who is replacing or taking your seat. The other thing is that if members are involved in advocating for staff on a member to member level, that is the best thing, that's the best advocate you could ever have in helping land the next job for your staffer. So if you, Rhett Brooks, are saying, I have this incredible person that covers X, Y, and Z for me and his portfolio, and you're talking at a member level, I don't hear many times that members turn that down when it's recommended uh, by another staffer. They may not have a position there, but the name is familiar, and then you never know who that second rep knows who's looking for job. Capitol Hill is a very insular network. It's just a matter of having someone advocate for you rather than you advocating for yourself. And if that's done at the member level, there's no better advocate than than you uh telling you telling other members how how much this person can benefit their office so it's a commitment tough to legislate but it it, it does take a, a networking component to it any ideas you might have dr pearson about making sure we don't lose some of particularly the constituent services folks um who have and they're in the district and it's it's tougher i think a little bit um for them to network unlike being out in dc the network is vast um any ideas about how we limit the staff defections for retiring members but yet uh help them find that job and everything that dr burgett said which i agree with one of our recommendations is to really bolster the house vacancy announcement and placement service and so if every job were actually posted there and every uh staffer in a retiring office actually sent in their resume and they were in the searchable database i know members go through many routes to find job candidates and so it would not be mandating that everyone use this but if it were more frequently used both by job seekers and those in positions to hire, I think that would really help. Um, and But it is more complicated with district offices, of course. And so many, if, if the person who replaces you was, say, of another party, that can make it more complicated for district office staff. And so then I think it's a matter of, you know, unfortunately, every member individually reaching out to people, retiring member, people that you know in the district, whether it's a state legislative office or a county board or a city council or uh, sort of depending on the type of job for constituent service, um, district outreach, it becomes more complicated. And I think, you know, it would be helpful to try to incentivize members to do that. But at the end of the day, for district staff, I think staff are really relying on um, the generosity of the retiring members. They do. Yeah. Thank you. I have one other very brief question, Mr. Chairman. Um, it has to do with interns. We And I want to commend uh, Rodney Davis and Zoe Lofgren for getting House Ad to allow us to compensate our DC interns, um, but it's still so cost prohibitive for uh, young people to come out and to have internships in Washington, DC and to find affordable places to live. Are there any initiatives you think we ought to put in place to try to help incentivize, you know, more truly it's typically the wealthier kids that can find their way to do internships or find places to live in Washington. And the stipend, while it's good, um, it's clearly not enough for housing, um, let alone any money to get them you know, into the next year of school. Um, so we end up with a pretty um, specific, often pool of candidates as interns. Any other ideas you might have how to help us uh, diversify our intern pool, which I think will then diversify the pool that, you know, come to work for us. Right. So absent of just increasing that stipend and making it more affordable, um, I would recommend having uh, institutionalized relationships with colleges and universities within your district um, to get, one, give them free credit for coming to to better compensate them on a, another side of the, the equation. Give them free college credit to come, uh, have a, a tuition uh, reimbursement paid back to the university or a lessened amount for people that come here. Um, just making it so they get a reward either academically 
or some sort of financial um, compensation from the institution that has some resources to do that. Because it's good for the university to say that I sent, uh, you know, six interns from my university, be a right. part of the school, make it competitive. It's good all the way around. Um, and there are some institutions with some funds. Maybe if we get through this pandemic, they'll still have some funds uh, to actually uh, to offset that. So then you get into the, or to help uh, pay for a stipend of housing. You know, there's there's other ways you can do it, but using the resources available to you in your districts, especially if it gets some college credit at the same time. Thank you. I would just echo that the University of Minnesota used to have a very successful program when a long time ago, uh, mem all of the members of the Minnesota delegation of both parties would agree to pay interns from the University of Minnesota if the university selected the interns and sort of made that end easier for them. And it was just terrific um, because uh, a more diverse socioeconomic group of students could go to Washington and that has ended. But to his credit, former Congressman Jim Ramstad um, came and helped raise some money to still pay some University of Minnesota interns um, several years ago. And unfortunately, that's ended. But there are relationships that individual members of Congress can do within their district to try to help facilitate that. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you both for helping us. I yield back. Terrific. Thanks, Ms. Brooks. Um, Mr. Cleaver, do you want me to uh, call on Mr. Davis or um, would you like to? Uh, Use the time now. I'm happy to come back no, to you if you. No, it's all been said. All been said. Uh, okay. I think, yes. Uh, Mr. Davis. Yes. Hey, thank you. And uh, thank you to my good friend, Mr. Cleaver, for uh, yielding uh, time a little sooner. Hey, this is great discussion. Look, I, uh, you know, I never knew I could leave when I was a 16 year staffer. I thought John Shimkus told me when I could leave, but instead he told me to come serve with him in Congress. Uh, but it, it's an interesting discussion because I, I've lived a lot of the issues that we're talking about today, and so has Rob and others that have been staffers. Um, but I, I also want to highlight, I think, some of the things that, that we are doing to address some of the concerns I think both doctors brought up. Uh, for example, the student loan program came about while I was a staffer, and that has helped us to retain many employees who end up getting their student loans paid off. And now because of what we all did in the CARES Act, that up to up to 50, the first $5,250 is now not taxable. So the employees, the student loan program, it used to hurt those lowest paid employees the most. So we couldn't afford to give them the higher amount of reimbursement because they couldn't afford the tax bill from Uncle Sam. Now they have $5,250 a year that's tax free to them that can go towards more retention activities. I think those are the types of programs that we do need to highlight in some of your recommendations that, that both of you have made. A uh, quick question for you, uh, Dr. Pearson. Now, you mentioned, uh, actually, Dr. Burgett, you mentioned the um, mental health access. You know, I, I, are you aware that we actually already provide that service with the Office of Employee Assistance as a matter of fact, um, we have, uh, you, you know, they'll make referrals to the outside sources, and it also includes, uh, it, it includes, uh, you know, their family members too. So has that not been working well enough? Um, th there's a few things that come to mind. One, I, I would just reiterate that there's, I don't know how many staffers actually know that that's an actual resource to them because they are hired so quickly and put to the ground, they don't know the available benefits. You're 100% correct. We've got to make sure people know what is available. And, and this, this counseling is available to members, mm -hmm. uh, and family and the staff. So mm -hmm. we got to do a better job, you're right. Yeah. And then I would say that there's, I've heard of backlogs with it as well. So in uh, hiring more of them, providing more counselors, providing teletherapy um, that isn't uh, so you you are seen walking in and out of the office or being referred out, um, just making it more accessible in the in the current environment. It would be my recommendation. I think that's a great recommendation. More opportunities to to do it uh, remotely. Mm -hmm. I think that's that. Obviously, the house is going to change the way we operate. Right. Uh, you know, the constant discussion that we have is. Uh, is the house going to open again as we knew it on March 13th? And I think for a while, we're going to see the opportunities for telework move forward. Uh, Dr. Pearson, 
Uh, you mentioned uh, mandatory training for workplace issues. Uh, you know, for our staff, uh, just like for members, we have mandatory cybersecurity training. We have mandatory workplace rights training. And we also have uh, mandatory ethics training. Uh, are, are you saying make a new mandatory training that doesn't fit into any of those three categories? That would be yes. So on a couple of different levels. And the first form uh, would be management training for chiefs of staff and direct district directors specifically. And so in addition to all of the important things that you just named, uh, it would actually be training in how to run an office, how to perform annual reviews, how to motivate a staff. Um, because obviously chiefs of staff tend to be very politically skilled, um, but they don't necessarily come to that job with a lot of experience in human resources management or how to manage staff. And of course, chief of, chiefs of staff themselves are pulled in a million different directions. And so that type of management training would really help them in a role of actually running an office beyond the important things like ethics and, and workplace rights. Um, but then the orientation for employees as well would also be much more comprehensive so that individuals, for example, knew things like the fact that there's uh, an employee assistance program where they can seek out counseling um, and, and other benefits as well. And so these, um, so that would be the management and rights training. And then there would also be substantive training on uh, the legislative process at, at a higher level and constituent services for staff as well. So a better onboarding process, more access to training. I mean, we, we already have many of those training opportunities available that many staffers uh, at offices don't take advantage of. I, I do want to say as my time is running out, the opportunity for us to increase our MRAs has to be balanced with the debate of how many offices turn back so many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And at the same time, we were all told uh, we were all told during discussion of voting for the CARES Act package that each office was going to get an extra twenty thousand dollars for their MRA that was could be used for communications, COVID related issues. But the majority appropriation staff decided to use those dollars instead to pay for uh, utilizing uh, FY19 leftover funds that we made available. Uh, so there's got to be some consistency and expectations so that those dollars can be budgeted too. So Derek, I see you look a little uh, a little concerned about that. I'd be happy to talk to you offline about that. I think that might be something to address. I yield back. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, next up, Mr. Newhouse. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. And I uh, gotta say, that like everybody else, this was a great conversation. Uh, many of the questions I had have been asked, so I almost emulate Mr. Cleaver. But uh, there are a couple things, and I'm sorry I'm going to be all over the board here, but just to fill in some of the gaps as the conversation um, has been progressing. Uh, bottom line is, I, I guess I understand, I think, in some ways, but I also uh, think it needs clarity. I, I want to ask what the goal here. Certainly, we want more experienced staff members, and we want them to be more valuable to, to the Congress and with that gained experience and all those kinds of things. But um, I guess that would be my number one question. In your view, uh, to our panelists, what, what do you what what to you to you, what would success look like to you? Would it be my scheduler stays four years instead of two years, or or, or my staff assistant stays a year and a, or three years instead of a year and a half? Or you know, I, I guess I, I want to get a handle on exactly what it is we're shooting for, and I think then in that way we can better um, utilize uh, whatever resources we have, and then. A couple other things, like I said, I'm all over the map here because of uh, being down toward the end of the questions. Um, what is the, you know, the average tenure of a member, and does that uh, have influence over the graphs that you presented to us? And just asking, throwing that question out. And then, not only do we compete with uh, outside industry. Uh, certainly, which is a goal of many of the staff members to move on, whether to law school or to K Street or something else. But we also can compete with committees as well. And so I'd just be interested in a conversation about a little bit about about that dynamic. And then uh, does does do your numbers uh, reflect the 
uh, uh, the moving up the ladder, so to speak, with with the, e either within the office or within the institution, is, is, does that reflect it in the tenure that you show on your graph? So, apologize for being all over the place, but like I said, just kind of filling in some gaps. So, I'll start with the last one first. That when you see the tenure bars or the median tenure on that chart, uh, as I mentioned before, it does not reflect any changes. Uh, in employment that is with that specific title. So if anything, it errs on the side of shorter tenures um, because you don't reflect right. the hiring up, which does off, uh, happen. So that's why you provide that second chart, which shows you the average turnover rates uh, by Congress by year. And that's why you get to, to 20% a year. But to go back to the, the very first question of what's the goal and what would I consider a win, um, it's yeah. lessening the opportunity cost for member or for staffers. Uh, to decide that service in Congress is now not worth it, to lower that difference between um, what I can do elsewhere, even if I wanted to stay. So it's rewarding people that want to stay, but then just don't have the resources to actually support a family on a congressional salary. That's a win for me. And then in terms about allocation of resources, you're going to have to triage what you put money to if you're able to get increased money at all. Um, to triage that, I would, I would ignore individual personal offices and just focus on committees. That's where expertise lies. That's where Congress is actually producing policies. That's where there's hearings and debates are being held. That's where staffers want to end up because there's better job security there. I would increase the salaries and availability towards committees. And then one final thing I'll say about committees is that we talk them as one resource themselves, but they're incredibly different. The sizes of them range from 100 staffers to 10. And then think about a financial services committee of who you're competing for. So you're competing against Wall Street, and those salaries on the private sector are very, very different than if you're working with an oversight and government reform committee. If you're talking about a telecommunications committee, you're competing with Silicon Valley. Think about the, the opportunity costs there. So you aren't, yeah, it depends right. on what committee you're thinking about, but you are, you're, there are different degrees of opportunity cost that I think need to be reflected. So to have a cap across the board on member on salaries for staff in, in personal offices and even on the committees, uh, I think can we can get a little more tailored to what we offer um, to to raise that cap so that opportunity cost doesn't become so high that they're making a decision that they would rather not make. And of course, that's that's always going to be true across any industry. But a win for me is getting people to serve Congress, want to be there to think about as a career and then not be forced out because they can't raise a, a family on a congressional service salary. That's a win for me. OK, OK, appreciate that. Thank you. I uh, won't echo, I mean, I echo everything that uh, Dr. Burgett said and just really want to reiterate the importance of the goal to have a well-trained expert staff who stays on the Hill for a career in Congress as long as they want to, that they're not forced out by circumstances of low pay or benefits or dissatisfaction with how an office is managed to go to the executive branch or a lobbyist or the private sector. And it is critically important to increase the expertise and pay and longevity of committee staff, but it's also important to increase the MRA so that individual staff um, can help guide members through policy changes that specifically affect their districts um, and their constituencies uh, and provide excellent constituent service, which you know may not be uh, on the first uh, thought on, on committee members' minds. So um, it's very important to have expert trained staff uh, in both personal offices and then, of course, in committees for the capacity of Congress. Sure, absolutely. I get that. And I've, I've got to hop up and join another call, but I appreciate very much your your attendance with us today. It's a very important subject. And, uh, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Newhouse. Uh, next up, Mr. Timmons. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, well, let's just start with the problem. I, I think we all agree that we got to find better ways to pay our staff and to um, get Congress up to par with really uh, K Street, with Wall Street, with uh, the rest of the country. These need to be desirable jobs. We need to have the best people in it because we spend trillions and trillions of dollars. And when we make small mistakes, it has huge consequences. So I guess the question is, how did we get here? And really, my understanding is in the 90s, the members did away with their cost of living adjustments. And we've proactively blocked that for almost two decades now. And that has kept our pay at 174. And that has kept our staff pay low. And that has caused the MRA to continually lag. So 
I mean, that's the problem. The problem is members are have been actively blocking their pay increases that everyone else in the federal government's getting. Um, so, you know, I have a couple of ideas on how we can message this and how we can uh, address it. But I think Leader Hoyer's words were hold hands and jump. And I mean, that's the conversation that we need to be having. Um, and, you know, I think November uh, after the election is the right time to do it. I'm sure there's going to be a CR anyway uh, to get to that point, or I would bet there is. So, you know, maybe that's the right time to have this conversation. As we were sitting here talking about this, I did a little math and um, co-equal branches of government, allegedly, the executive branch salaries are over a two-year cycle, uh, 2019, 2020, they're going to exceed $500 billion. The judicial branch salaries are going to exceed $12 billion. The, uh, congressional, sal the congressional salaries for policymakers be at the staff or the member, well, I'm not including members, is about $5 billion. So the, the, the branch of government that's responsible for, over these last two years, spending $12 trillion, I mean, that is such an enormous amount of money, is the lowest funded uh, salary branch, uh, branch of government with the lowest, lowest funded salaries. So, I mean, this is a serious problem. Um, I've got some tricks that I've proposed to try to find a way to, to address this without kind of biting a bullet and just raising the MRA and raising member pay, which, uh, you know, I think the best way to do it without the political challenges associated with actually just increasing pay and increasing the MRA um, would be to separate the franking budget. We've already discussed that. Um, if you make that $150,000, $200,000, and the purpose of it is increased um, communication with your constituents, I think that's a, an easy thing politically to, to message. Um, maybe a hardware budget. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of offices were ill-equipped uh, at COVID-19 to address um, you know, teleworking, whether it's they didn't have laptops, good, good cell phones, good connections. So that's something I um, think is worth doing. I mean, what other ways can we backdoor fix this problem? Um, and I'll open that to either one of you. Well, and first, do you all agree with that general assessment of the problem? Absolutely. And, and I would be I would love to hear your thoughts on how to best message this because I, I found one of the most successful ones is the co-equal branch of government argument, um, especially during these times. And then you just you point out and you make clear the disparities between each of the branches. As you mentioned, the judicial branch has more staff resources than the United States Congress. And just looking at the, the, the it, when you drill down to individual uh, departments and committees, the, when you talk about an oversight perspective, I think that there's bipartisan agreement about the, the need for oversight. Uh, the, just for example, the Department of Agriculture has uh, 400 or 45,000 employees. The, the Agriculture Committee has 45 staffers. So just think about the, the how you cannot, that's to, to legislate, that is to communicate, that is to have some constituent service concerns and to oversee that department. You can't do it. That is not a co-equal uh, branch. You're not there. You're not, you're not even serving the role. I agree. Uh, and Dr. Pearson, I'm sure you have a follow-up, but I'm running out of time. Um, I think teleworking is going to be something that is is, is definitely part of uh, offices going forward. We're already talking about doing away with our district offices just because um, we've had some of the most challenging work constituent services wise in the last three months. And we did it incredibly well. And I'm very proud of the, the team that we have. And, you know, if we need to meet with somebody, we can do it in a coffee shop. And we would save $80,000 a year if we didn't have district offices. And that's uh, a, a huge amount of, of money to help increase pay. Um, last thing, you know, I've said this before, the, the dual duty station issue with members, um, you know, we have, and we're, we're coming up on an issue where members are going to be challenged financially to serve. The cost of living in Washington, D.C. is absolutely insane. I was paying $2,700 a month for my apartment. I got rid of that. I now stay in hotels, thankfully. Um, you know, I did that in January. Didn't realize how lucky I would be. Um, Last comment before I turn it back. Committee budgets being 70, 30, uh, majority, minority. I, I really think that that needs to be closer to 50, 50. And, uh, you know, that would create the continuity for committee staff and we'd be able to maintain um, uh, a lot of expertise there. So I really appreciate y'all taking the time. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thanks, Mr. Timmons. Um, I want to invite if there's members who um, 
had a second round of questions that they uh, didn't get an opportunity to ask. Uh, give them that opportunity. I know Mr. Woodall said you had a, a follow up, and Mr. Cleaver, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to weigh yes, in I on. Do. Okay, go ahead, yes. Mr. Cleaver. Okay, th thank you very much. I appreciate. I, I really like working with you guys. I, I'm. I, I uh, uh, it probably sounds corny, but I do. I mean, for a lot of reasons. One of them is that uh, it just feels like we are, you know, human beings uh, trying to address some real problems to make things better, and not Republicans or Democrats trying to figure out how we can hurt each other. Uh, but here's. Uh, uh, you know, one of the problems we had created some of the problems was, you know, the, the federal judges were held, the salaries were, uh, you know, a couple to, to, to hours. And about, uh, let's see, five years ago, they filed suit. And I remember telling people in Congress, I said, they're going to win the suit uh, because they wanted to be decoupled. And, and, I, and people said, well, no, they're not, they're not going to, uh, that's not going to happen. And I said, you forgot who. Uh, is going to render the decision, and so they decoupled us and received about two hundred thousand dollars in back pay. They would make earn the same thing we were making, two hundred thousand dollars in back pay, and uh, I think the salaries are now two something, whatever I can't remember now. It was two two hundred and something, and so they've gone on now. They were put together uh, as uh, some of you may recall. Uh, if Zoe was there, she she obviously can speak probably much more articulately. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 plan was keep them uh, uh, connected with the judges, and then uh, nobody would get upset if you vote to give the judges uh, a uh, a pay raise. Uh, well, uh, uh, it didn't work. The judges said we don't want to we don't want to have that anymore. Uh, and and so we we're back here. And what we do is. Um, and, and, and for us to fix this, we'd have to be disciplined. What we do is we we, we push things that um, that hurt ourselves and doesn't improve our image with the public. Uh, I think I've been asked one time at a at a uh, at a, at a uh, town hall meeting how much money uh, we made, and it was a it was a, a kid kid who who asked the question, um, and and so. There's not anybody in Congress who uh, is is getting elected because they turned some money back in, uh, and and I hope people understand when the money is turned back in, it goes to the speaker's discretion, uh, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, it goes to the speaker's discretion, uh, and, and so we heard ourselves. Nobody is praised for it. My predecessor, Karen uh, McCarthy, uh, Zoe would remember probably the only one that was there when she was there. My predecessor, Karen McCarthy. Uh, who unfortunately had the fastest moving case of Alzheimer's in, in uh, medical history, at least as far as they could determine, and died shortly thereafter. But she would turn back in uh, $100,000 uh, every year. Uh, and uh, at the end of her career, the newspaper here blistered her, uh, saying, you know, instead of paying your staff or uh, uh, doing things that would actually improve their ability to your ability to report to help the community, you know, you try to impress people with doing something that nobody uh, is concerned about. I mean, there was never an article during the time that she was turning money back in saying, "Well, she's a great legislator. We need to uh, move her up. She probably needs to be the Secretary of the Treasury." I mean, nothing, zero, zilch. So nobody even knew it, and um, and and then we started saying we don't want to get a raise. Well. We've got millionaires, and I'm not mad at millionaires. I'm mad because I don't. I'm not one, but um, I, I think you know they don't, uh, in, on both sides of the aisle. I, some of us in the Democratic Caucus have gotten angry with some people. I won't go into who, who they are because they're all they always oppose raises. But I, this is not about raises for me. This is, goes back now uh, to Mr. Chairman just shortly. Um, I, I go back. We can do this, and I'm willing to stand up uh, and uh, and and be whatever vocal person we need to do. I, there's nobody who's lost the race because they they tried to get their staffs more money, or they tried to get themselves more money. I mean, nobody. So I, I mean, I I I, uh, I think we ought to we ought to have more money in our budgets. And I think you know what I've been suggesting about the going to the GSA to to 
make it possible. We go to GSA. They, they take over a lot of responsibilities, a lot of finances. Nobody's going to get mad because uh, because they get the, that department got more money. And then the money that's up that we have left, which should be over $100,000 a year uh, uh, in our MRA, uh, would allow us to do so many things. And and, I, and nobody's going to lose a lose an election because we did it. In fact, the, the you know we're doing it for the public, and and, and I'm a I'm a witness. Uh, nobody's been in this conversation talking about doing something with the money that would not benefit the the uh, constituents in their congressional district. And 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 we're doing this without people without the press listening listening. So somebody could do you know, could slip in something like uh, we want to do this so so we can. Um, you know, do something stupid or something. It's, this would help the country. So uh, I, I appreciate this conversation. I really, deep down, uh, appreciate it. And uh, and and I think we have to just step out and be. You know, um, I, mean, we, I don't think we can have congressional timidity as a, a reason for not moving on this thing. And I, I and I, I, I someone just said, perhaps the election is a good time. Uh, you know, I think any time would be a good time. That would certainly be a, a better time. But and I would, and, you know, if somebody said, "Well, I'm not going to stand up and say this or or, or promote this," I, I put it all on me. I'll do it without even flashing up an eyebrow. So, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You and the and, and the ranking member have been fabulous. I said that to some people here the other day, and I and I've told people what we we're talking about, and I haven't heard anybody yet to say, "Boy, that modernization committee." You know, we ought to try to get them out of out of office. They, I mean, most people say, "Oh, but it's about time." It's about time. So I'm doing, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thanks so much, Mr. Cleaver. Um, I know Mr. Woodall had a uh, some additional questions. I've got a couple as well. So go ahead, Mr. Woodall. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just have uh, two. Uh, one, I'll follow up on the conversation that uh, we've been uh, talking about. Uh, uh, member uh, salary. Uh, while that is absolutely a problem, and particularly folks with young families have uh, bigger problems, uh, we all are blessed to have this opportunity, and we choose this lifestyle. Uh, no one forces you to be a member of Congress. Um, that same thing is true on the congressional staff uh, space. I'll stipulate um, that diversity is an issue, and it benefits uh, the country. I'll, I'll stipulate that work-life balance is a, an issue, and it and it and it benefits the country. Um, when you all, because dollars and cents are the easiest thing for us to solve, when you all look at the triggers uh, for uh, uh, for better retention, uh, uh, salary ranks where in your expertise? Uh, uh, is it at the top? Is it in the middle, or is it close to the bottom? Uh, Dr. Pearson, could you uh, begin that? Uh, sure, thank you. According to a survey of staffers by the Congressional Management Foundation, salary ranked first. Um, uh, I think that, Dr. Burgett, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think number two was office management sort of satisfaction with your work conditions in your office. But salary definitely ranked as the highest uh, factor that uh, reason that staffers were dissatisfied with their, their work. The understanding that that's what that survey reported, is that the right question? Particularly as I listened to your testimony, Dr. Pearson, uh, it's less about keeping the people that are already self-selecting for Capitol Hill, and Dr. Burgett men mentioned that also. It's more about reaching out to folks who never uh, came to Capitol Hill. Of it, uh, when I was a, a legislative correspondent, my biggest gripe was salary. Uh, but the truth is, I'd have done the job for free because how lucky was I uh, to be able to work on uh, on Capitol Hill? Um, when, when we're, uh, do you again because you understand this issue in ways that I don't? You trust that Congressional Management Found Foundation survey of the self-selected uh, congressional staffers who are already uh, committed to Capitol Hill as being indicative of how we can more successfully uh, attract and retain folks who have not yet chosen Capitol Hill? I do. I do trust it because um, it was a systematic survey. And I also trust it because it squares with the anecdotal evidence that we have heard from so many, um, both current staffers, former staffers, um, and former members as well. And so, I, but, you know, there are two issues here, recruiting 
and retaining staff, a more diverse staff, and then also retaining the expert staff that we already have, who've spent several years gaining that policy expertise and that political expertise and sort of knowing how to get things done on the Hill. But after five years, as the high turnover rates uh, that Dr. Burgett showed us, just leave for a more lucrative job opportunity. So the low pay relates to both our Congress's ability to attract a more diverse workforce, but it also relates to Congress's um, ability to retain some of the policy expertise that it has uh, sort of in enabled over a period of years to retain that expertise longer. Well, and that's actually my second uh, uh, question, uh, Dr. Burgett. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, certainly true that we're focused on retention. Um, Rodney Davis and I happen to be the exception where constituents said, uh, here folks with two decades of congressional staff experience, let's retain them to send them to Capitol Hill uh, to be our congressman. Most folks say, I want somebody with business experience. I want that teacher from back home. I want my local minister. I want somebody from outside of government. Um, as we work to retain people, and again, I'll stipulate there, folks, we need to retain. Uh, is there a benefit to the revolving door in Congress where an expert leaves the Energy and Commerce Committee and goes and, and learns in Silicon Valley and then comes back to the Energy and, Co and Commerce Bit Committee, is that all bad? Uh, and do we want to quash it all? Or is there a, a, a real benefit uh, in terms of, of congressional expertise uh, to have folks come at that high level of expertise for a short period of time and then revolve back out? Right. So it's not all bad. And I, I, I'm of the mind that the more that we can get business to better talk to government, that's not bad. So to do that better, it, it helps to have former government servants in those positions. What I will say is that there's very, very, very few people that use that revolving door back in. It's a one way. The revolving door is a misnomer. It goes one way and it's from inside to out and it very, very rarely comes outside to end. So that's what I'll say. It's not all bad. I, I, expertise is good no matter where you place it. It's just a matter of if you want to uh, pay government employees to gain expertise that is very particular to this Congress, to a Congress, an insular environment, um, to, to, to invest in them only to use that for their, their benefit on the outside. You can't stop it. It's not bad. I don't blame them for making that choice. But I, I think it's it would behoove Congress and individual members and especially committees to to lessen that gap so that people do actually stick around because Congress should and could be a, a career in and of itself. The, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you bringing uh, uh, experts in. Uh, our life is full of anecdotal evidence. As Dr. Uh, Burgett was talking, I was thinking through all the staff directors on committees that I know were downtown uh, two years ago and have now come back uh, to uh, uh, Capitol Hill. My budget committee would be uh, one of those rules committee from the uh, from the uh, White House, uh, Kevin McCarthy's chief of staff downtown back again on the Hill uh, first. Uh, and so I don't uh, I don't see data. Uh, I see uh, I see the window uh, through which I look. Uh, so I very much appreciate you bringing folks uh, uh, who uh, have made a life of of uh, uh, getting uh, beyond the window uh, that I sit by. Uh, thank you both uh, for your expertise and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Woodall, and uh, the gratitude you express uh, appropriate to the hearing should be directed to our terrific staff who uh, brought in these two terrific experts. Um, I, I actually had a couple of things I wanted to cover before we close this out. Um, Dr. Burgett, uh, you know, staff get burnt out by the same issues as members, um, you know, polarization, you know, you. Uh, we had a former member hearing and the things you heard about were, you know, Frustration with the lack of impact in the policy process, um, frustration with the polarization. We have as a committee already recommended some ways to try to imp improve collaboration and bipartisanship among members. Any ideas about how we could do that with staff? Not great ones. No, it's it's a commitment and it's just a, it's a leading by example kind of thing. And then just fostering environments where it's not us versus them. A lot of this, you, you see committee by committee offices, they're very, very different. Some committees have great relationships with minority and my majority staff. This is a great example of that. But it, it mirrors the commitment set by the chair and the ranking member usually. And that's true with personal offices too. So outside of more gimmicky options of like creating a networking event or getting people in the same room, which sounds good on paper, but it's really hard to actually accomplish or make it systematic. Uh, no, it's 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 a commitment and it's a it's a consequence of the time we live in 
And I wish I had a better answer, but I don't. Dr. Pearson, did you want to weigh in on that or? I'll weigh in just briefly. And the, the, legislative professional training and the professional development training there would be online modules for those but ideally those would be in-person trainings i remember as a staff member going all the way through the crs training that culminated in richmond virginia where you know the staff play the role of legislators and i never got to know so many staffers across the aisle as i did at that point and it was extremely valuable in the time that i remained on capitol hill and so i wouldn't underestimate the value of that intense legislative training or the professional development um, that could occur, although it's not a panacea, polarization is way too intense for that. Yeah. yeah. I'm also just curious, you know, the, the data you presented make clear that it, there's a small percentage of Hill staff that stick around for a, for a long time. I, of those who do, are there, are there any common reasons for why they stay? Um, anything that we can learn or apply from from those circumstances, or are they just unique individuals whose experiences may not apply across the board? This speaks to, to Representative Woodall's observation that he sees people come in and out of the Hill, and this is again speaks to the self-selection effect. A lot of people, for motivations of uh, they like proximity to power, or they they know they're doing good work, or they get better jobs in higher ranking offices, they this is the life they live. Um, so I don't think that there's uh, individual characteristics across the board that we can point out and say let's just go find these people it's more of a motivation thing and and they've been rewarded or at least well enough and compensated or at least well enough or they have outside resources or at least just enough to make this uh the career that we all think that it should be for for others or at least the opportunity of but no there's not a uh just a gene or a trait that we can just you know isolate in the brain and be like yep you're our congress people come here and and serve so but it is a commitment and they've been rewarded enough uh, to stick around and and they've they've they made that choice which is great I would add one thing to that list uh, which I think is is absolutely a great list um is that some staffers who find a member of Congress who they really like and manages the office well and treats them well and whose priorities and mission they really believe in, that can help with longevity as well. You do see some members on Capitol Hill, including members of this committee, where the staff have stayed for a long time, and it's because the member motivates them both from a management perspective and from a sort of political values-driven perspective. Well, thank you. Um I think I've now heard from all of the other members that they don't have any further questions. So with that, I uh, want to thank our two guests uh, for sharing their wisdom with us today. Um, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for their willingness to keep the committee's work moving forward. Um, also, uh, um, <laughs> appropriate to the uh, content of today's uh, discussion, I want to thank the staff of the committee that has done a terrific job of uh, pulling together these information sessions and making sure that we have uh, um, uh, uh, wise people like you informing us. Um, Dr. Pearson, knowing that Jake uh, learned under your learning tree explains uh, why he is such a, a, a talented member of uh, this committee's team. So well done. Uh, with that, thanks everybody. Uh, this discussion stands adjourned. Take care everyone, thanks. Thank you all. Thank you.